In order to understand genetics, it is important to realize how the genetic material is organized in each individual cell. The heritable material of an organism, called DNA, can be found in the nucleus of each cell of the body. DNA is packaged into thread-like structures called chromosomes. Each chromosome consists of DNA tightly coiled around proteins called histones that support the structure. DNA is compromised of four nucleotides, which form base pairs – adenine, guanine, cytosine and thymine. All traits are coded on the DNA by a certain sequence of nucleotides called genes or alleles. They form the units of inheritance that transmit information from parents to offspring. The nucleus of a human body cell contains 46 chromosomes, which are organized in 23 pairs. 22 pairs are autosomes, and one pair represents the sex chromosomes, determining the sex of the organism. XY here represents a male, whereas XX would represent a female. In order to understand how chromosomes are inherited, it is important to understand the difference between the division of a normal and a reproductive cell. The cell division of a normal cell of the body is called mitosis. Mitosis results in two daughter cells which both have the same number of chromosomes as that of the original cell before the division. This process is typical for normal growth of tissues. The cell division that leads to the reproductive cells being either sperm or egg cells is called meiosis. Meiosis results in four daughter cells, which each have half of the number of chromosomes as that of the original cell before the division. After meiosis, an egg cell will contain 23 chromosomes from the mother, whereas the sperm cell will contain 23 chromosomes from the father. When a sperm cell and an egg cell fuse, the resulting zygote contains half of the chromosomes from the father and half of the chromosomes from the mother. This cell can now grow into a new organism. Several scientific studies have indicated that show betas have 42 chromosomes organized in 21 pairs. No sex chromosomes were identified so far. Over the years there has been a lot of speculation about the possible effect of environmental factors on sex determination. To date, no hard conclusions could be drawn as most scientific articles show a very limited experimental approach and power. Let's discuss some basic terminology. The genetic makeup of an organism, the genes, are called the genotype. The physical and physiological characteristics of an organism, which we can observe with our eyes, are called the phenotype. The phenotype is influenced by genetic makeup and environmental factors. When a dominant or recessive gene for a certain characteristic is identical on both chromosomes of a pair, we call the organism homozygous for this particular trait. This means that the organism will breed true for this trait. When an organism has two different copies of a gene on each chromosome, it is called heterozygous. Both versions of the gene can be passed on to the next generation. When a gene is fully expressed in the phenotype of a heterozygous organism, the trait is called dominant. Some examples of dominant traits in show betas are long fin, spreader resistance and extended red. When a gene is masked by a dominant gene in the phenotype of a homozygous organism, the trait is called recessive. Some examples of recessive traits in show betas are short fin, large pectorals, Cambodian and Milano. We speak of partial dominance when a gene is not fully masked in the phenotype of an heterozygous organism. Some characteristics of the trait can still be recognized in the phenotype. Some examples of partial dominant traits in show betas are double tail, crown tail, and the classical iridescent color steel blue, turquoise and royal blue. So how can we use this information in our breeding programs? Let us take an example here using the dominant long fin trait and the recessive short fin trait. In the following slides we will try to predict the outcome where we would cross a pure long fin with a short fin fish. Please note that the dominant trait is shown in capital letters and the recessive trait in lowercase letters. In order to predict the outcome of such cross, we will use a Punnett square. The diagram is used by biologists to determine the probability of an offspring having a particular phenotype. As I've mentioned before, each reproductive cell contains half of the genetic material of an organism. This means one copy of a trait is inherited from each parent, and by using this diagram, we can visualize what possible combinations can pop up from this cross. 
In the first generation, F1, we can see that in this case all the offspring has inherited one copy of the dominant long fin trait and one copy of the recessive short fin trait. This means that the phenotype will be long fin, but genetically this fish will be carrier of short fin. Let's make a prediction of the outcome of the second generation, F2, using the Panet Square method. This time we will cross two long fin fish from the first generation which both are carrier of short fin. The offspring can inherit either the dominant long fin trait or the recessive short fin trait from each parent. By using this diagram we can visualize what possible combinations can pop up from this cross. And we can see three different combinations popping up. Offspring receiving the dominant long fin trait from both parents. Offspring receiving the dominant long fin trait from one parent and the recessive short fin trait from the other and offspring receiving the recessive short fin trait from both parents. Phenotypically this means that 75% of the spawn will be long fin. However, 25% of the long fin fish is homozygous for the trait and will breed true. 50% of the offspring will be phenotypically long fin but genetically carrier of short fin whereas 25% of the spawn will be short fin as they are homozygous for the recessive short fin trait. It is important to keep in mind that the long fin fish can be carrier of short fin, but a short fin fish never carrier of long fin. When using a Panet square one should realize that the calculated results often do not represent the outcome of one single spawn. The calculated percentages only will be approached after averaging the results of a large number of spawns with parents of the same genetic makeup. Nevertheless, we can use the Punet Square as a valuable tool to predict the chance of a certain outcome. I hope this video gave you some insight in the basic terminology of genetics. In order to stay tuned for more, please subscribe to my channel.